Good afternoon. Many of you joining us today remember that we have previously hosted these events on the Aging at Altitude expos and seminars at the Jewish Community Center in Boulder. Well, this year, due to the COVID crisis, um, for the first time ever, we are hosting a virtual expo and webinar series. My name is Al Manzi. I'm the president and CEO for Prairie Mountain Media, publisher for the camera and moderator for today's event. First of all, let me welcome everyone today to what is our 10th webinar in the series. It's entitled Brain Health, Distinguishing Between Dementias. Before I introduce today's speakers, uh, please notice the Q&A and chat boxes at the bottom of your device screen. Um, you can enter your questions anytime during this presentation, so you don't have to wait till the end to enter them. Uh, as you think of those questions, you can go ahead and enter them. Um, and when the speakers are finished, after about 40 minutes of their presentation time, we'll have about 20 minutes for what we hope will be a very vibrant uh, Q&A period. And I would like to remind everybody that if you go to dailycamera.com backslash aging, you can, you can see our actual um, virtual expo, which, uh, which is in support of all of our partners um, that are with us this year. Now let's get started. Joining us today is Dr. Hali Long. She's with Alta Vista Senior Residences and also Adam Santasevan. He's a marketing director for memory care at Alta Vita. So I'll now turn it over to Dr. Hali Long. Good morning. Okay, sorry. I gotta make my screen bigger so I can see what's happening here. Can you guys see me? But how do I make it bigger so I can see my screen too? Okay. Your notes are on the screen now. Oh, are they? Okay. Uh, there we go. You guys can see it now? We can. Okay, good. So, um, good morning or good afternoon. Uh, my name is Hale Nekarad Long. I'm a geriatric psychiatrist uh, and a medical director of Alta Vida uh, Memory Care Center and Residences. And this is kind of weird. It's kind of like comedians when they say they're all doing their shows online. Um, not to see the audience, but um, given the COVID, this is going to be interesting. But if you have any questions, please uh, type them in, and then at the end, Al and I will answer them. So to start off, um, you know, we are going to be talking about not everyone has Alzheimer's dementia, and we'll talk about why people always think of Alzheimer's as a first um, diagnosis when you say my loved one has dementia. Um, first of all, we need to understand the meaning of dementia. And sometimes they start off with cognitive um, impairment, which we call mild cognitive impairment, which is uh, an, another word, um, you know, you, you can hear people say MCI. And this is what that means, which is impaired memory, but otherwise they're functioning really well in everything else in their life. Um, they're able to still live on their own and they don't meet cl uh, clinical criteria for uh, diagnosis of dementia, which we'll talk about in a minute. But this MCI may be the first or the earliest sign of evolving into um, Alzheimer's dementia. There was a study that uh, they looked at um, people with MCI and how it converts into 
Alzheimer's dementia, and there was a 50% conversion every year as they lived through with MCI. Um, and at this earliest level, neuropsychological testing, which we call neuropsych testing, uh, may be helpful to um, pick up people with diagnosed MCI. Um, for example, I had one lady, this was uh, several years ago, and her only complaint was that she worked at Macy's, actually in Boulder, Macy's, and the only thing that she had noticed was after 23 years of being a cashier, she could not count um, change when somebody gave her cash. And that was just devastating to her, and also uh, the fact that her mother and her um, two of her mother's sisters, so her maternal aunt, had dementia. <clears throat> so we did do a neuropsych testing. She came back as MCI, and unfortunately, in like three, four years, she developed full dementia diagnosis. But at this level, you just want to make sure there's nothing organic, which what that means is nothing medical causing the memory loss. Um, because the sooner diagnosis, the better outcome with the treatment. So what is the meaning of dementia? Because, uh, you know, people always say, you know, so my mom has um, Alzheimer's, right? She doesn't have dementia or my dad has dementia, but not Alzheimer's. So um, the meaning of dementia, I, I look at it as um, diagnosis of, let's say you're talking about a medical and it's like cancer. You say, I have cancer, but then people are like, whoa, what type of cancer? Um, so this is an umbrella of what dementia means, and then you can have different causes of dementia. So dementia in itself is impairment in short-term, long-term memory loss, impairment in abstract re thinking or reasoning. So sometimes people with dementia start getting to be very unreasonable. They want to live on their own. They still want to drive. They don't want to take their medications. Impairment in judgment. Um, which, you know, people that are living on their own, they may uh, get taken advantage of financially uh, and give their money to scammers. Personality changes. I've had so many families that are like, oh my gosh, I wish you knew my mom before dementia because she would never act this way. Um, so that's a really hard one. You know, people can get really agitated, aggressive, hit, or become hypersexual. And uh, it's very different than their, um, obviously, their pre-dementia diagnosis. Apraxia, which is uh, forgetting how to do things. So people forget how to do things. And one of the earliest signs of the apraxia is, um, and of course, our life is very complicated with electronics and stuff. But one of the earliest signs can be um, of um, using the remote for their TV or using the phone, um, they're not able to dial out. Uh, I know that, you know, my dad has dementia and I know one of the first signs for him was he kept having difficulty signing on on his um, computer. And we had to go through it every time. And, you know, us as family would get mad at him because he couldn't figure it out. And then finally, in a few years, um, he was diagnosed with dementia. Uh, aphasia is difficulty with speech and, uh, you know, people with uh, dementia develop having uh, difficulty finding words, uh, difficulty expressing themselves, but also it can be the other way around too. They're unable to understand. So there are two types of dementia, uh, aphasias. One is expressive aphasia, so they're not able to tell us what they want to say. And the second one is comprehensive aphasia, which is they're not able to understand what we're trying to tell them. So it could be you come and you go, hey, Joe, you need to go take a shower. But all they hear is, hey, Joe, they don't know what else you're asking them or why you want them to take a shower, which, which can be a sign, um, kind of trigger for agitation. So, so that was the diagnosis. Um, that was series of symptoms, right? So you got, um, different types of dementias. And one of the first ones, which is the most cases, is Alzheimer's dementia. So 55 to 65% of people have Alzheimer's dementia, which is why I think the first thing you think of 
when they say you have dementia, you think of Alzheimer's, which is pretty good chance that that's what it is, but there are other types of dementias too. And we'll go through all these in a minute. I'm gonna spend um, like two, three minutes on each type of dementia, but you can have Alzheimer's, you can have vascular dementia, you can have dementia with Lewy bodies, Parkinson's disease patients, if they live long enough with Parkinson's, they will develop dementia. Um, frontotemporal lobe dementias, which are hard ones to de deal with, and we'll talk about that in a minute too. Um, then there is chronic alcohol use, um, B12 deficiency, infectious disease. If you don't know that you've had syphilis uh, most of your life and it ends up becoming neurocephalus at a young, uh, at an older age, HIV, um, cancers like brain tumors, meningiomas, um, and there are other types which I'm not going to spend too much time on because um, they're rare. So Huntington's, mad cow disease, um, progressive supranuclear palsy. So there are different types of dementias that can be caused. But the first one, 50 to 60% of our population, when you say they have dementia, they have Alzheimer's. And it's interesting because the first time um, this was diagnosed or described was in 1907 with Dr. Eloise Alzheimer's, who um, originally he thought this was like a rare disease. And the first patient that he had was a 52 year old woman who um, was psychotic, uh, having difficulty with um, personality changes. And back then, you know, they thought like she had schizophrenia or she was possessed. Um, but he started to look at it a little differently that no, this is not your normal psychosis or something else wrong with this lady. And then after she passed, they did a um, brain um, autopsy and she, he found what we'll look at in a minute. But it is amazing to that, you know, since 1907, we really haven't had um, too much more into like diagnosing um, Alzheimer's except recently a PET scan was um, approved by the FDA. But Alzheimer's disease has become one of the most um, common diseases in the aging population. And it actually is the sixth most uh, common cause of death, which we'll talk about in a minute too. So Alzheimer's dementia, age is number one risk. So if we all live long enough, um, it's highly likely that you will end up with um, dementia. Uh, family history increases your risk by three to four times. Uh, and then of course, if you have a both parents, you know, if you have it in both uh, mother and father or uh, grandparents, it puts you at higher risk. Head trauma, so we know that from the studies with uh, football players and boxers, that head trauma is pretty, um, puts you at higher risk for uh, Alzheimer's. If you're female, which um, we're still having trouble with this one because uh, I think uh, female population lives longer than male, so maybe that's what it is, or maybe it's hormonal changes. We just don't really know. Uh, and it is a gradual presentation, so it takes about 10 years on average before it gets diagnosed because, um, and I mean, that's a good thing because at first people are just having minimal um, presentation. But mem uh, memory impairment is one of the earliest signs in this one. So this is important to remember that memory impairment is uh, starts early. And as they develop um, and live with it longer, you have more psychiatric symptoms, um, depression, uh, apathy, agitation, aggression, psychosis, delusions, pacing behaviors, wandering, hoarding, sleep problems. So if you see this, these symptoms, you kind of feel like, oh my God, these people are um, becoming psychotic at by the end of the time, but it is from their dementia, it's from what is happening to the brain. And I've had this before too, that uh, sometimes in the hospital, we get people that are really psychotic, agitated, and that they got diagnosed with a new onset schizophrenia, which is pretty rare uh, if you're in your 70s and 80s and all of a sudden you develop new onset schizophrenia. Um, so don't fall for that. It's probably um, dementia with 
psychosis. And here's one, I just picked this up from the Alzheimer's Association uh, website. Uh, it's quite amazing because, you know, right now we have 5.8 million people living with dementia. And as you can see, um, as I said, age is number one risk. And as you can see, number uh, one, 65 to 74 uh, years old, there's about 17% of them. After age 75, it becomes almost 50%. And after age 85, there's 36% that are living with dementia. And this number is supposed to um, uh, triple by uh, year 2050 because we're all living longer. And this is what's happening in the brain. So I like to show this to family members that are having difficulty uh, understanding and accepting the diagnosis of dementia because sometimes the behaviors are really tough to handle and families are like, I know my mom is doing this on purpose or my dad's doing it on purpose. But look at their brain. Like if you see, this is your frontal lobe. Um, and then if this is a normal brain, so normal brain, hopefully we all have this right now, which is a plump, um, healthy brain. And as you get plaques and tangles, um, your brain starts to shrink. And this is what you see on an MRI. It would say um, brain atrophy, which basically just means brain shrinkage. Um, so as you get more tangles, as you get more plaques, um, our brain is a protein, so it starts to kind of shrink up. And uh, look at this, the frontal lobe is pretty bad, and so is the um, temporal parietal lobe. And this one I like to show actually to caregivers because um, it's a better understanding of what's happening to the brain. This is the PET scan. and. This is a normal brain. Again, hopefully most of us tending this have this type of brain, which is the red is good, red is healthy. Um, and as you get early Alzheimer's or uh, that mild cognitive impairment, you start losing some stuff from the back of the brain. This is the back of the brain right here. Uh, and this is the front of the brain. Um, so you start losing some healthy tissue and uh, parietal temporal lobes. And as your dementia progresses, you start losing frontal lobe plus temporal and uh, parietal lobe. And as you can see, when you're, this is a brain of a um, four year old um, brain, four to five year old brain. And as you can see, your brain starts looking a lot like when you, there's a child. And I'm not saying these are children. It's just their behaviors becomes uh, more childish-like. Um, so they um, have tantrums. They say no. They don't want to shower. They are um, agitated when you uh, approach them with something, when they don't want to do something. Uh, so this is a good one to kind of keep in mind uh, that, you know, my loved one is not doing this on purpose. Uh, like I have to keep reminding my mom of that, which is, it's hard to be a caregiver, but um, that is the reason. So as you can see, is there's a progression and their brain looks like a child. Um, so we're moving on to the vascular type dementia. Vascular type dementia, as I said before, it was 10 to 15% of uh, dementia diagnosis, <clears throat> most likely have vascular type. And this is, just as it says, it's um, uh, from strokes, mini strokes. You can have a focal sign, which means <clears throat> you can get a weakness on one side of um, your face. You know, they, have, they can have a droopy face or they um, have weakness on their um, left or right side. And it happens quickly, so it can be an abrupt onset. But then afterwards, it's kind of a more um, slower progression than Alzheimer's is. And the onset of the dementia can happen uh, within three months of your stroke. So just because you had a stroke and at the beginning you didn't have any memory problems, but as you live with it longer, you may be having some mini strokes or what we call TIAs, transient ischemic uh, 
uh, accidents. And um, as you get more of those, you start having more uh, memory problems. And uh, with autopsy, we're finding that um, there's a lot of mix as you age, uh, as you get older. Like I said, you're at high risk of uh, Alzheimer's, but also as you get older, we see more and more of a combination of Alzheimer's and vascular type dementia. Risk factors, again, age is number one risk, but also having had a history of strokes, heart attacks, smoking, hypertension, diabetes, high cholesterol, atrial fibrillation, because atrial fibrillation, that means like your heart is beating really fast. So there is a high risk of um, little uh, clots forming and getting um, many strokes. And this is what uh, an MRI of, um, or CT would show, that people have little tiny white spots in their brain, tiny, tiny. Was that, as you can see, um, you also have um, shrinkage of the brain too. Um, so it, it can be um, both of those things. Um, Lewy body dementia, um, Lewy body dementia, it's again, it's a type of dementia that happens in another 10 to 15% of population with dementia diagnosis. And this one can get mixed up with Parkinson's disease because they get Parkins, Parkinsonism, which means they can have tremors in their hand, they can have um, uh, unsteady gait or shuffling gait, and it can get mixed up with uh, Parkinson's. And the danger with that is that Parkinson's medications are not um, effective with this type of dementia and it actually makes their hallucinations worse. So um, as you put them on uh, Cinemet or Parkinson's medications, their hallucination gets really worse with the visual hallucination. They can get very agitated uh, because of too much uh, dopamine. But with this one, two or three of these uh, symptoms need to go with the dementia diagnosis. So they're either Parkinsonism visual hallucination, sleep disorder, they're acting out their dreams, they're having nightmares, uh, fluctuating uh, cognition, which is um, they're a lot better in the morning, but they sundown terribly in the evening. Uh, and then you can see Lewy bodies uh, in their brain. And this is a Lewy body. And guess what? Dr. Lewy um, discovered this Lewy body and named it after himself. So that's basically why you call it Lewy body dementia is because of the physician who uh, spotted this um, Lewy body in the brain of the patients. So moving on to Parkinson's um, diagnosis. And as I said, if you live long enough with Parkinson's disease, there's 40% risk that you will develop dementia. These people, I always say it's uh, chicken or egg, so which one came first? If you had dementia first and then you uh, develop Parkinsonism, it's most likely that it's Lewy body dementia. But if you start with Parkinson's disease and then you start having um, dementia diagnosis, it's most likely par Parkinson's disease with dementia. Um, these people can have you know, all the Parkinson's symptoms, um, including uh, bradykinesia, rigidity, tremors, and uh, they actually respond quite well to um, Cinemet, which is levodopa carbidopa, um, and their life can be improved with Cinemet. But again, this can be mistaken with Lewy body dementia. Frontotemporal lobe dementias, these are actually really hard ones to treat because they're, uh, they have a lot of behavior issues, and uh, fortunately, it's only like five to six percent of people that develop this. But with this type of dementia, you're usually looking at somebody who's had um, a lot of um, brain trauma, um, traumatic brain injury. Um, alcoholics can get frontal lobe dysfunction. Um, so with this type. Actually, memory is at the later stages of the disease. 
So usually they um, start having personality changes, labor mood, agitation, hypersexuality, which is very embarrassing for family members. Um, and then they develop uh, speech difficulties, um, forgetting how to use things, uh, naming things, uh, having difficulty with expressive aphasia. And sometimes at the later stages, they develop echolalia, which is they're repeating your words when you say it. Usually memory is at a later stage of the disease. Um, and they do have abnormal brain imaging, which I'll show you in a minute. But the problem is we don't have a lot of good medications to treat this. So you're usually trying to treat the symptom. And this is what a brain of a frontal lobe dementia looks like. As you can see, uh, the front, this is the front of the brain. This is a normal brain. This is a brain of uh, frontal lobe dementia patient. And as you can see, it's pretty impaired comparing to a plump brain. Um, and then alcohol dementia is another one because um, a lot of patients develop alcohol dementia at a later um, time in their life. And they, they always say, but you know what, dad quit like 30, 40 years ago, but that doesn't matter, dad already um, damaged his brain by using uh, severe alcohol or um, alcohol use at a younger age. Even if you quit uh, 10, 20 years ago, the effects are still um, permanent. And um, there's actually a term they call it alcohol-related brain damage, uh, which is caused by, caused by regular drinking um, too much. Um, and we believe that it is because of a vitamin B1 deficiency or thiamine deficiency. Uh, and also heavy drinking uh, is a toxin to the brain. So it causes brain chemical changes, again, shrinkage of the brain, tissue. And one interesting thing about this one, I find it fascinating, is confabulation. Um, and what that means is that they have this false or distorted um, memories that they bring up. And um, they're very believable. The stories that they say are very believable. Um, because at some level, maybe that thing happened, but then they have this elaborate story of how things were. And then when you talk to their family, they're like, uh, no, that never happened. But it's very fascinating with, um, with them. And there's impaired memory, thinking, planning, reasoning, um, and personality changes and behaviors. Usually at the later stages, they can be very agitated and uh, combative with um, ADLs. So dementia workup, um, you wanna make sure, like I said at the beginning, there's nothing organic causing it. And what that means is there's nothing medical. So you wanna make sure that there's no B12 deficiency, no folate deficiency. Um, and B12 deficiency can be caused by, um, you know, people that have um, had stomach surgeries or bariatric surgeries for weight loss at a younger age. Uh, basically, we need B12, uh, we need um, stomach lining to absorb B12. And if you don't, if that's messed up, you can get B12 deficiency, which can cause dementia. Um, sometimes that's reversible, especially if it's caught at earliest stages. Folate deficiency, thyroid problems, uh, urine analysis, because if you have a urine um, infection, which I'll talk about in a minute, uh, CBC, which is your blood count, CMP, which is uh, checking your sodium, potassium, making sure that uh, that's not cause of the, um, what we're seeing. And then again, uh, syphilis and HIV, but I only check that if it's indicated. I don't do it in everybody. Brain imaging, and um, just recently, about a week ago, there was actually a FDA approved uh, PET scan, um, which is great because now what that means is that insurances are gonna start uh, paying for PET scans because it's really hard to get insurances to pay for PET scan, uh, ruling out um, Dementias, usually they want you to get a CT or MRI. So 
with this recent FDA approval, hopefully we'll get um, some more coverage for the PET scan. And then neuropsych testing, like I said, if you're not sure of the diagnosis, uh, checking a neuropsych testing, which is about a three to four hour testing. If it's shorter, it means that you didn't do so well, so they kind of cut it short. But if it's longer, it's actually a good sign because it means you're doing well. Medicare pays for neuropsych testing. Um, so usually I do that if I'm not sure what type of uh, dementia I'm thinking about or if they're at early stages. Questioning alcohol and pain medication use because both of these can affect your memory. And if you're continuing to use alcohol or pain medication, opioids is a huge one, and you're having memory difficulties, um, this is a really good one to ask. Depression and anxiety screen, because we actually had a term for uh, people with depression and dementia, which is called uh, pseudo dementia. So what that means is that it's not a real dementia. So if you treat the depression, um, sometimes the dementia or the memory loss goes away, but the studies have also shown that if um, you are developing dementia from depression and it gets better, it's you're a higher risk of uh, developing um, the real dementia later on. And then insomnia and apnea work, um, it's important, especially if people are having nightmares or having difficulty sleeping through the night or acting out their dream. I remember this was uh, the acting out your dream was part of um, Lewy body dementia um, diagnosis. A huge one is ruling out delirium because I can't tell you how many people I get on my unit that um, they're saying this person is demented. However, um, they have been sick. So you can't diagnose uh, dementia in the midst of a delirium episode. So you have to kind of look at the whole picture, look at the big picture. Um, and 30 to 50% of um, sick dementia patients or geriatric patients become delirious at some point during their hospital stay. But I can assure you that all of us, um, all hundred of us, I guess, um, have been delirious at some point in your life. Because if you've been under anesthesia and after you come out of anesthesia and you're kind of out of it, you're delirious. Or if um, you have um, had a temperature of 101, 102, 103 as a child, um, you become delirious. So all of us have been delirious at some point, but it's very important for elderly to diagnose dementia because it is a rapid onset. So it can be hours to days, brief duration, hopefully. Sometimes it um, can last for months and sometimes they don't clear all the way back, especially if you have dementia. So alternating level of consciousness, so they're um, sundown really fast and then they are disoriented, disorganized, they have memory impairment, Psychosis is huge in this one, um, and disruption of um, sleep-wake cycle. So what that means is they sleep during the day, they're up at night. Uh, and in my, um, with the caregivers, they're very good at picking this up these days because um, I've done this uh, talk with them too. That you know, you guys are the frontliners, so you need to tell me if this was this person is all of a sudden is really agitated, really psychotic, they're not sleeping through the night. Okay, what's number one cause of um, delirium? I can't hear you, but I hope you all said urinary tract infection um, because that is number one cause of um, delirium in older patients. Uh, and it's really easy to fix, correct? Because you just need uh, antibiotics, it may take a few weeks for them to clear up, but once they've had this delirium uh, with a urinary tract infection, in the future, every time they get psychotic or they have increased memory problem, the first thing you wanna do is check for a UTI. Of course, all the other medical problems can also cause um, delirious dehydration. And I had one case, um, this woman who was living on her own and um, she got very 
psychotic and uh, delusional, confused. And when the daughter took her to ER, she was dehydrated. But what had happened was that she didn't want her daughter to tell her, hey, mom, you can't live on your own because you keep eating bad food and having diarrhea. And that's what had happened to her. She um, had she was eating something bad from her fridge. She had diarrhea. She didn't want to tell her daughter. So she got dehydrated, ended up delirious, ended up in the hospital for three days. Uh, pneumonia can cause it. Flu can cause it. Actually, COVID can cause it. Um, we've had several um, delirious cases from COVID. Constipation, which is amazing, right? Because you wouldn't think like constipation could affect your brain, but it does. Um, any kind of um, neurological infection, so meningitis, after stroke, um, hypoxemia, which means low um, oxygen level, high or low sugar level, thyroid disease. And remember, that's why we checked um, something uh, at the beginning when I said cause, um, rule out organic causes was checking for thyroid disease. Drugs, um, I can't tell you how many times People use uh, Tylenol PM, uh, Motrin PM, and the PM part is just Benadryl. Uh, and then they get confused and everybody's like, ah, oh, what's happening? And then when I ask them, you know, are you having sleep problems or not? They kind of say, oh, no, honey, I take Motrin PM or Advil PM. And here's the culprit. If you take it day in, day out, uh, for multiple um, days at a time, you are going to get confused because they're out um, anticholinergic. And as you can see, most of the medications, especially anesthesia, can cause it. So I'm to the point of, you know, if you don't have to have surgery and you, ha you have dementia, but it's not a matter of life or death, I wouldn't do surgery because after anesthesia, most of them come out with more cognitive problems. And I can't tell you how many times people have had, like, um, it happened to one of my good friends, actually, her mom had a cardiac issue, which wasn't like death or life, you know, living, but the cardiologist was like, yeah, no, it's just a, you know, a one hour procedure, she'll be fine. And she was never fine. Um, she got very delirious and actually passed away in the hospital. Um, Drug withdrawal, and um, this is another big one. Alcohol is a huge one. Uh, I've gotten consults before that people come in like just for like a knee replacement, and then all of a sudden they're just confused as all you can get, and people are like, oh my God, is this person demented? But then when you ask them about their alcohol use or you ask the spouse about alcohol use, they um, tell you that, oh yeah, they were drinking, but we're just embarrassed to tell you how much they were drinking. So please be honest when you are having surgery about how much benzos, which is Ativan, Valium, Xanax, or pain medications, how much you use because we can prevent it from happening. We can put you on something for withdrawal so you don't experience the delirium. Reasons for delay, delayed diagnosis. Uh, a lot of people think that it's nor part of normal aging. Um, but the only thing normal about memory is slower processing. It is not normal for you to have short-term memory problems or long-term memory problems. If it took you to um, 20 minutes to do your paycheck, uh, like checkbook before, it may take you 40 minutes at, as you age. And that's normal. That's the only normal part of aging. Uh, otherwise, oh, uh, <laughs> You guys saw my um, surprise, but insidious onset, and it's so slow that people um, get used to it, so they don't understand that's what's happening. Lack of routine screening. However, Medicare recently put in um, that everybody needs to be screened once a year above age 65, once a year for memory loss. So hopefully we're going to catch people a little sooner. But the biggest one is denial. And this denial can be from a denial of patient or family members. And this is why I love doing what I do. I love little feisty um, elderlies that come in with their boxing gloves and telling me that you can't tell me 
you know that I have dementia and I can't take my own medications or I can't drive. But sometimes, well, not sometimes, all the times I'm the bad guy and I'd rather be the bad guy than the family. Uh, you know, that you can just blame it on me to say, you know, she said you can't drive. I didn't say that. Um, and then memory medications, I'm just going to go through them uh, quickly because we have five more minutes. But what I want you to understand is that it doesn't prolong life because that's what I hear all the time that, well, I mean, if she's getting dementia, do we really want to prolong her life? But memory medication don't prolong life. What they do is they improve quality of life to improve um, self-sufficiency, prolong self-sufficiency. And there was actually a study, unfortunately, we're not doing studies that much on older patients because usually they have a lot of comorbidities. Drug companies don't like to have negative outcomes on their research, but um, it just hasn't been much done. But there was a study that showing that if you started early enough, that people could have um, decreased risk of nursing home placement by almost uh, a year, which is pretty good, I mean, in the grand scheme of things. Uh, memory enhancing medications, we haven't had anything new um, since my daughter was born, which was 21 years ago. Um, so unfortunately, I don't know what's happening, but we haven't had anything new. Um, that we, we keep hearing about uh, dementia vaccine, uh, new dementia, um, and that doesn't mean there's not enough studies because uh, when I look last, there was 164 new um, products under uh, investigation for dementia, but you know nothing has panned out. A couple of reasons: um, one is that we're using um, the with the case studies. We're using people that are already demented. So it, it's, you know, it should start at my age, like in your 50s, when uh, you have, like my dad has dementia, I'm um, 50 plus. Uh, so it should start in me so we can see if this is going to prevent it or not. But it's, since it's so expensive to follow somebody for 10, 20 years, we're just not seeing that. And I think we're just capturing the wrong population. And then also um, when the older patients have comorbidities, so uh, drug companies don't like to um, enter people that have comorbidities because it um, reflects negatively on their studies. But expectation with the memory medications, um, maybe you have some improvement, but really, this is what you're looking for. You're looking for less than expected decline or no change because you want to keep the person <clears throat> steady and functional at the level they're at. So we don't have anything that reverses the uh, dementia. Um, and behavior problems are huge. Uh, I'm gonna run through this pretty quickly because I think I only have two minutes. Uh, but depression, anxiety, isolation, agitation, psychosis, which can be visual, auditory hallucinations, so people can see things or hear things that are not there. Sleep uh, disturbances, poor appetite, inappropriate sexual comments or behaviors, uh, which are embarrassing for family members. Uh, and then there's always this kind of depression versus apathy because a lot of dementia patients with that frontal lobe that I talked about, um, atrophy, they get apathetic. That doesn't mean they're depressed. Um, and it's really hard for the family and uh, staff to deal with this because they're like, so-and-so is so depressed. They're always in their room. But I can tell you that when I've gotten this and there was one case that was just the cutest thing ever, uh, as soon as I walked in, she, I mean, she was just sitting there in her room, no TV on, but she was totally content. And the first thing she told me was that I like your sweater because I wear a lot of colors all the time. And, and I was like, well, if somebody depressed, first of all, they wouldn't notice my sweater. And second of all, usually they tell me to get the hell out of their room. They don't want to talk to me. Um, so this person was apathetic, which just means it's, um, they're not concerned. They're just, they just don't have any interest in things. 
they're not sad. And the reason I'm emphasizing on this is that the antidepressants are not effective. Because I always get this too. Well, can we start on an antidepressant? But that's just one more medicine with one more side effect, and it's not going to help them. At times, Ritalin has been more effective, uh, which I've seen that before. Paranoia and psychosis, this is a huge one because people get paranoid and psychotic and they get agitated because they're scared. But the hard part about this one, I go back to the FDA, there's no FDA approved treatment. Um, so when you look at the black box warning, it's gonna say that this increases risk of death in your loved one. And I've had so many family members that have said, I don't want my mom to live in fear so please go ahead and use it, um, which they can be pretty effective. Caregiver burden, I mean, you guys know it better than I do if you're attending this conference that, um, you know, you do a lot of work that is unpaid. And sometimes um, they're ungrateful because they don't know, like my, you know, my dad, when he's mad at my mom for changing him, he doesn't, he's not doing it on purpose, but uh, it's a kind of, thankless job, let's say. Um, and psychological costs to the caregiver is huge. 80% of them uh, report high stress level. 50% of them actually meet diagnosis for depression. And as you see this one, signs of stress in caregivers, it's amazing because it looks like you're the patient. Anger, anxiety, depression, exhaustion, sleeplessness, social withdrawal. These last two um, just from my own experience with my mom and dad. So when my dad doesn't sleep, my mom doesn't sleep. When she stops taking him out because she's embarrassed of his behaviors, um, she starts becoming socially withdrawn and um, her world gets smaller. Health problems because they put, uh, they put their health problems on the back burner. They won't go to the doctor because they can't take the person. So as you can see, this looks like you can be the patient, the caregiver. And wandering behavior, about 59% of people that live in the community wander off. And there's no way of predicting it um, because sometimes they can get in their head that I'm going to work or um, I got to go pick up my kids. Uh, and if they're not found within 24 hours, almost 50% of them die of hypothermia or dehydration if it's hot outside. This is a huge, um, really nice program. It's called Safe Return Bracelet. And um, I've had several of my patients being found this way. Uh, there was one example of um, this gentleman who actually took the screens off his um, window at their home because the wife had all sorts of locks in the front door, so he couldn't get out the front door. But he had taken the screen off because he was an engineer and had um, wandered off. And the mailman down the street found him, looked at the bracelet. And the nice thing about this one is that um, it's actually an ID. It doesn't have where you live, but it has a number for the 1-800 number that they call. And um, the police is um, alerted. And actually, the, this time with the postman, they called the wife at home and they said, do you know where John is? And she, she said, well, at home. And they're like, and she said, I'm in the kitchen. They're like, nope, he's on ninth and whatever. So she went and picked him up. Uh, and I love Alzheimer's Association. Um, you know, they're always there for you. And, um, they're, they're not volunteers. These uh, phones are answered by professionals. Uh, reasons for placement, uh, disease severity, loss of functional uh, abilities, like, you know, when you become incontinence, it's really hard to deal with. And of course, behavior problems of uh, paranoia, agitation, uh, wandering off, not sleeping through the night, all those things. And um, so I'm going to Look at that, I went over like four minutes, but I'm sorry. But um, I want you to, if you are in Boulder, please, please, please join our walk. I'm hoping that this will still happen, but it may not with COVID, so, but they still need money for research.
And the Alzheimer's Association is one of the um, few uh, charity that spends um, 89 cents of a dollar on uh, services. So they do research, they uh, provide uh, respite care for families, they provide the 24 seven um, hotline, uh, they provide the, um, the uh, Wonder Guard or the Wonder Guard bracelet. So um, even if you're not gonna join it, you can donate. And I don't care if you donate to our team or not, just, don just donate to uh, Alzheimer's Walk in Boulder. And it's a beautiful walk. Uh, it happens on CU campus, and this will be their fourth year there. But that is the end of my, um, let me see. Now I gotta figure out. Dr. Long, that was great. Thank you. Um, we, uh, we have tons of questions, so I wanted to, uh, I wanna move into the question and answer period here. Okay. Um, so if you can, uh, because we went long, let's, uh, let's try to keep the answers as succinct as possible. Yes. What physician do you recommend to conduct this type of testing? So, so um, yeah, so um, neurologists are usually pretty good. I mean, preferably a geriatric psychiatrist like myself, but we're such a unicorn in this world that there's not um, anybody in Boulder County, but neurologists can do it. And, um, there are uh, what we call neuropsychologists um, who do the neuropsych testing. And like I said, Medicare um, pays for a lot of those testings. Excellent. So that would be, and then you can start with your primary care physician and tell them that you're having problems and have them refer you to different resources. Excellent. Does testing and a negative outcome impact one's ability to get long-term life insurance? Would you know that? Yes, it does. So get your long-term care insurance before, especially if you got, um, if you're suspicious and then apply and then do the testing. But yes, it does. I mean, it's just like having uh, a medical problem like diabetes. Um, but yeah, they have access to your records. Um, and it is the world we live in, unfortunately. What advice can you give to somebody who has to, who's trying to convince a loved one to get tested? Um, so at the beginning, like I said, uh, people are usually very um, difficult to agree to it, but if they're not going to comply with the testing, they're not going to comply. I've had people that come into my office and they just hold their arms and just sit there. They're like, nope. No, nope, not answering that, not going there. But as a caregiver, I think I always listen to the caregivers and think if you're telling me that this is happening, I believe you. Um, but yes, it's very difficult. But sometimes getting your um, children involved, sometimes they listen to the, your, your kids better than to the spouse um, or somebody that they um, trust because sometimes when you're a spouse and you're a close one, you know, I talked about the delusional thought process. That's actually one of the number one um, type of delusion with um, psychosis with dementia patients is that they think their spouse is against them or they're having an affair or, um, you know, so that can be iffy. So if you can find somebody else they trust. And Dr. Long, there is a really good, um, educational program that is put on through the Alzheimer's Association called Dementia Conversations that does specifically address the conversation of when is it time for testing and how do we have that conversation or when right. is it time to move into a community or bring in additional help and how to approach that with the individual in question. Right. Yeah, thank you for saying that. But yes, that's what that's why I said, you know, the Alzheimer's Association is a great um, program and please donate if you can. Um, Dr. Long, what causes B12 dementia? And can this be caused by long-term use of acid reflux medications? That's an interesting question. Uh, yes, it can actually, because so B12, like I said, it's absorbed through our gut. Uh, there's a layer that it absorbs it. And uh, yes, we're finding that if you're on PPIs forever, 
that there is a risk of B12 deficiency. But just because you have that um, doesn't mean you can't, if you need to take the PPI or the acid reflux, you can take it, but make sure you get a B12 um, test too. And the reason that you're B12 deficient is because you can't absorb it. So you end up getting uh, needing B12 injections. So it's a once a month injection uh, that you can get. So your gut doesn't have to work hard to absorb the B12, but it gets absorbed through your blood. So Dr. regarding neuro, neuropsychological testing, is it a general test or specific to the dementia diagnosis? Specific to the dementia diagnosis. And um, can- And you actually, well, like when you write for the um, referral, that's what you would say. You, you would say rule out um, MCI, like mild cognitive impairment versus dementia. So the, these, are, these are, I think, two similar questions. Um, can you take B12 supplements and thiamine supplements um, to, uh, uh, to avoid having to get shots or, or uh, pot potentially impact uh, uh, B12 di uh, dementia? So um, it depends of, again, if you have B12 deficiency, sometimes it could be that you're not eating or you're not receiving enough B12, but also I think number one cause of it is that your body is not able to absorb it. Um, so if that's the case, you need the B12 shot. But if it's the case that you're just not eating well, yes, B12 supplements uh, help with that. And thiamine is a different story. Thiamine, usually when you're um, thiamine deficient, it means that you're drinking too much. The alcohol is the culprit there. And so I would, I, would, I would say, you know, cut down on your drinking and you can take thiamine um, supplements orally. And do you re recommend getting, this is an interesting question, do you recommend getting a brain scan uh, at say 65 to establish a brain image baseline? You can if your insurance pays for it because the insurance won't pay for it just to say for the heck of it. Yeah, but they could pay for it themselves if they've got the, the means. Yeah, but I mean, what are you going to do with that information if it comes back that it's, this is just like, I'm going to go, can I add something to this? Sure. Uh, with, the, with the genetic testing, um, you know, what are you going to do with the genetic testing information? If it, it's just like the dementia. So what if my scan comes back that I do have a frontal lobe uh, atrophy. Now, what am I going to do with that information since I'm pretty healthy? But if it makes you feel better, if you have, um, you know, family member or um, genetic uh, component to it, you can. But I can tell you that one of my friends did this in his 40s, um, and he went as John Doe, like because he didn't want it in his, um, you know, uh, medical records. So he bought something online, did the testing, and now we're in our 50s and every day of his life, he's like, I'm gonna be demented. Just because you test positive for genetic testing doesn't mean you're gonna develop it. It just puts you at higher risk. So and, if you would like to do that, that's fine. But remember too, if it comes back positive and then you haven't had, you didn't buy long-term care insurance, then you're kind of screwed because it's in your uh, medical records. Interesting. And um, so talking about lifestyle, um, you didn't really talk at all about that. Can you, what, what type of lifestyles do you recommend to prevent dementia um, overall? Well, that's, that's its own lecture of 45 minutes, but in short, it's um, whatever it's good for your heart is good for your brain. And there was a study that looked at seven different types of um, preventions. And the only, so it was like omega-3, um, hormone replacement, um, anti-inflammatory, um, I can't remember all of it. Oh, puzzles. And there were two more. And then the seventh one was exercise. The only thing that came out uh, protective 
was 20 minutes of aerobic exercise four to five times a week. So, and what that means is you get to the point that you can't talk that well, but that's what aerobic. And it's just 20 minutes. You don't have to do it for an hour. You don't have to do it for 45 minutes. Uh, so exercise is number one. Number two is, uh, again, anything good for your heart, good for your brain. So keeping your uh, blood pressure under control, diabetes, um, so hypertension, diabetes, cholesterol, um, um, oh, uh, apnea, because if you're continuously getting hypoxic at night, um, like if you're a really bad snorer, uh, you need to check that out, not just for your bed partner, just check it just because it's bad for you. Because uh, what that means is your brain goes into hypoxia every night. Um, and then, you know, there are some studies saying that Mediterranean diet is better. And the reason being is because it's all good, good antioxidants um, with Mediterranean diet. It's uh, lower beef or lower um, meat, higher vegetables, uh, olive oil. Um, so all those things are avocados, um, omega-3s and food. Uh, yeah, so, but again, that, that would be a, its own little lecture. And I saw that somebody was doing that, I think, in this aging altitude. We, we, we did. We, we, actually, we actually did uh, cover quite a bit of that in our, our previous one uh, with Dr. Right. And, and Dr. Henry. Um, my, uh, we have a question about somebody who says their ex uh, had a gastric bypass 18 years ago. He continues to drink alcohol in the past 16 years. His personality has become very erratic. He's got terribly poor judgment, distorted views of memories of events. Um, and she's, this person says, I'm convinced the gastric bypass caused deficiencies in nutrition and alcohol caused his changes. You seem to be confirming what I've always believed and I don't want to excuse his behavior, but it sure helps explain what's going on to our children. Perhaps yes. you can address that, that comment. So just with that little caveat, yes, you're absolutely right. So he was B12 deficient from his gastric bypass but you also be 12 deficient with alcohol and your thiamine deficient with alcohol use. Um, and I would probably say he has alcohol dementia or uh, Korsakoff dementia. So and what, do you, what do you personally recommend for dementia prevention and what do you do personally for prevention? You mentioned both your mom and dad have issues. So what are you doing yeah. personally? So uh, thankfully it's just my dad, but um, no, my sorry. mom's pretty healthy, but, um, I, yeah, I know I, I need to, um, practice what I preach, but I do stay active, uh, with, you know, hiking, exercising, um, and I do eat healthy and I'm from Iran. So we are already on kind of Mediterranean diet kind of thing, but yes, eating healthy. Um, I check my, um, vitamin levels every year. Uh, but most of us in the U.S. are vitamin D deficient. Not that that causes um, memory loss, but it can cause um, bone loss. And uh, so I would recommend you getting your um, vitamin levels checked, your thyroid checked, um, exercising, keeping your blood pressure, blood sugar down. And I do most of those. And, and perhaps Adam could could, uh, could tell us a little bit about um, what families should expect when they uh, when they when they make a visit to your to your uh, to your care facility. Uh, I think that it depends on you know what what you're talking about as far as what to expect. I mean, if you're coming into a community um, looking to move somebody in, um, you now I always I always tell families to ask those questions of what's important to you. What are you looking for? Um, because you can't expect to see a lot of different behaviors. You're going to come into a community and you're going to see, you know, people who um, can't express how they're feeling. Like Dr. Lung was talking about that aphasia, um, repeating their words. You're going to see people who um, are not mobile anymore. You'll see a lot of people who are in wheelchairs. You'll see some people who are completely independent walking around, um, they don't even look like they belong in a community. Um, 
So what, what to expect is, it's a very broad kind of statement to, to ask there. Mm -hmm. um, I think each community, um, you know, I'm always going to be in support of Alta Vida, but um, you know, there's tons of different care communities out there that are fantastic. And each one of us have a different philosophy of what care looks like. Um, and I think really it comes down to being able to, um, you know, kind of envision what you're looking for, for your loved one, what type of care, what type of environment, um, and just doing your research and really looking at all the different options and visiting those options, asking questions. Um, I always tell families, there's no such thing as a dumb question. Uh, there's really not because this industry is so vast and we all offer so many different things that um, you can have multiple communities that are a fit for you. Um, so you, you, I mean, that's a, that's a very broad statement question yeah. there. So I think um, one thing would be to, like Adam says, um, go in with kind of knowing that you're going to see every stage of dementia because um, like at Alta Vida, I, this is my baby. I started it. Uh, we opened up in 2012. So it's becoming a teenager now, but um, <laughs> it's, it's just one of those things like that Alta Vida, the whole concept is, you know, the sooner you, you join is better because you're more active. You, you're able to participate in all the activities. You get to know the other staff members. They get to know you. You end up like having really close relationships with a lot of staff and some residents. But also the whole concept is that we don't kick them out as they get more and more demented or they're unable to express themselves or they're unable to walk any longer. Um, because, you know, and I, at the beginning, there was a slide that said it's the sixth cause of death in the U.S. And you don't die of Alzheimer's per se, you die of what Alzheimer's does to your brain and your organs. So uh, the top three causes of death with Alzheimer's, number one is actually falls. Because the brain, as it's shrinking, it affects your muscles and you're unable to walk as well. So you're gonna start falling. Uh, number two cause is aspiration pneumonia, because again, we have this epiglottis muscle in your um, neck that kind of helps make the food go down easily. But with dementia, that smooth muscle movement goes away and people start coughing, aspirating on their food or drink and they can get pneumonia. Um, and number three cause is um, a stroke, which is, you know, what, like we talked about with the vascular type dementia, you can get the TIAs or you get one big stroke and then you decide as a family member, you know, maybe it's time to do hospice. And that's what we do at Alta Vida because I think it's one of the worst things can be that you kick somebody out of their room as they get more demented because then they're like, what's happening? Who are all these new people and where am I? So it can be very confusing to the person uh, dying and actually the family members too, because staff becomes part of your family. And that's what's been really hard about COVID uh, that families can't visit because we actually miss the families too, you know, as much as they're missing us or they're missing their loved ones because we used to have people that come and volunteer, that play the piano, you know, they bring cards. And so we're okay. missing them just as much as they're missing us. Well, um, Dr. Warner, that was, you know, we, we went very long on this one and, and uh, there's just always so much interest in this. You, you did a marvelous job, uh, Adam. Thank you for, for being here. Uh, I just want to remind everybody that um, uh, we, you've got access to the videos um, and the webinar at all, all the webinars at dailycamera.com backslash aging. This one will be available this evening. Uh, we had some people asking about when could they watch it. They can watch it this evening. Um, and also uh, tomorrow's program or Monday's program rather is a webinar on hospice and palliative care um, uh, being presented right. through community care. So, uh, again, I want to thank everyone, uh, especially Dr. Long and, 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 and Adam for uh, just a terrific presentation. And uh, I know we didn't get to every single question, but uh, 
um, I know they're available if you have if you if you desire other information from and them. one last word is especially since you said there's a uh, hospice conference um, people do uh, you can um, qualify for hospice with dementia diagnosis Excellent. That's because right. it was a misnomer that oh no you have to have cancer you have to be dying in six months that's not true uh, if if your dementia is severe enough, uh, you can get qualified for that. Well, thank you again, everyone, and uh, I wish everyone a good afternoon. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Bye.